Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have a good friend of mine and co-founder, Latino Founders. It's actually a Latino accelerator group. Edgar, how are we doing? Doing great, Gabriel. Thanks for the invite. I'm you know, pretty stoked to you know to be on the other side of the mic for, for one. Yes, yeah. For those folks that are unaware, in fact, Edgar runs an actual podcast as well. So please go ahead and check him out. But today, we're actually going to be talking about Clica Digital. So, be, but before we get into that, Edgar, let's introduce the world. To who is Edgar? Give him a little background. Oh man, uh, a little background. So I'm a uh, you know was born in uh, well, raised in Mexico City. I uh, came to the U.S. quite a while ago. You know, first to for you know to get my undergrad. Um, uh, but just a little, you know, just before even before that, I went to um to school like a prep school in northern Mexico where I was pretty much sent to do, that was the first time I was actually sent, you know, out of my house um, to the, what's probably called kind of like the, the MIT of Mexico, so actually the Monterey Tech uh, for, for prep school. So I lived there just, uh, and they, my my parents' idea, I guess, was for me to stay at the Monterey uh, Technolo- Institute of Technology uh, in Monterrey, Northern Mexico. But, you know, I ended up uh, choosing Texas, you know, I was a swimmer back in college, so you made a good opportunity to go swim for Texas State. Uh, it's just a great experience. So, but and, and ever since then, I I stay here. And about twenty years ago, I ended up in Portland, Oregon. Somehow, yeah. Wow. But yeah, just so so that that uh, and then you know I came here to Portland for a little bit uh, for about a year, year and a half. Then I ended up, you know, we got married. When we came back from our honeymoon, I ended up, you know, uh, coming back and there was an acceptance letter for uh, grad school in Italy. And yeah, we just, you know, came back from our honeymoon and, and all of a sudden we're packing up our stuff to, to move to Italy, man. And finding out my wife was, was pregnant already. So, you know, we, we left two and we came back three man, after a <laughs> while. <laughs> so tell me about this school. Like, how did, how did the kind of, how did the transition kind of happen from Mexico to did you apply to prep school at Italy or, you know, for graduate school at Italy? And how did that yeah. transition happen? Yeah. 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 Because, you know, my, my idea to go to uh, grad school, it was, you know, I, it, I had my top choices, which were the top um, five European MBA programs. And I was like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty competitive. They're, um, and I didn't want to stay in the U S because I had in my head back, back then, I had already had the experience as an international student in a U.S. institution. So I was like, well, now I want a different perspective. You know, I want to, I want to gain more, you know, more than just not only the education, but that world exposure. So I looked at those schools and, you know, a couple of them uh, um, accepted me, but my my top choice was, was that, which I thought honestly was a long choice. And going back to like uh, uh, two years prior, I had a, I had a plan. Of course they didn't, they didn't accept me. It's, It's a small program, you know, for, you know, you know, compared to the to the U.S. ones, um, very very competitive. I'm like, and and I think I was just the the token, uh, uh, you know, people like exceptionally smart, um, and it's a great experience. You know, it was it was everything I was hoping and plus plus more. How do you feel that experience kind of prepared you for becoming an entrepreneur, which we'll talk about here shortly? How did you feel like it prepared you for this moment? Uh, it, it, well, first of all, it gave me a ton of contact, you know, I get brought different opinions, working with different cultures, which I think was the most valuable one, or one of the most valuable things that I got from the program is being in, 
you know, in, in, working in collaboration with different, literally every single culture imaginable. Like we're working with Greek people, Turkish, you know, Latin Americans, Americans, um, you know, Germans. So that uh, <laughs> worldview, it, it you know, it, it, it was one of a kind. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you read it sometimes in Facebook, unless you're there, like, oh my gosh, you're arguing. Well, in a good sense and, and listening, learning from other perspectives and just trying to absorb everything, you know, from the cultural to the way they think, uh, to the way they act. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I think that's one of the, the ways that it started preparing, you know, number one, start observing, asking questions. Um, I'm probably asking the right questions, or you know, learning how not to ask questions as well. <laughs> but you know that that you know, opening up your mind to to be more inquisitive and you know what's out there, other than well, shit, you know, I mean, we're living in little bubbles, and you know, there's way more of uh, to the world than, than than what we think. Yes, that's very true. That's very true. Yeah. So let's start. Let's talk about um, Clicat Digital. One, tell them, yeah. tell the tell the audience what is it, and then let's talk about how you started it. Well, Clicker, we started. It, it's um, we call it, it's a platform, you know, to um, that really brings down, you know, the the, the digital component to the masses. And I, I want to say to the underrepresented, because our mission is really to create all these technologies for the people that have been left behind in the digital world. So we're, you know, we're coming out of hopefully up, out of the pandemic, and we we've seen this this need, you know, for the how it's exacerbated. People are jumping into the digital world businesses you know and everybody that survived was because we were in a digital world but what we also didn't realize is what we've been doing for the past seven years is you know this accentuated the problem that we've been working on and it actually has made it worse that some people are being left behind you know some people don't have access and i'm, I'm, I'm gonna go back like how we founded this is like i remember reading this article on the economist and and I think you and I were pretty fortunate. We we grew up in in household that you know certainly we're not you know super well off, but you know we, we were comfortable. We we always had a good a meal, a roof on earth, and that's privilege. So that was the first thing that that you know that has come to my realization how privileged we are, even though we think we may not have been. Um, but you know going back, I was reading this article in two, 2013 or fourteen, and it said something like. I think that the name of the article is like uh, it is it is expensive to be poor, and that caught my eye. I was like, "What?" So I started reading about it, and it's and, and you started looking, listening, you know, why it's expensive to be poor, and why so many people can't get out of that vortex, and then, then you start, you know, looking at how what you know the inaccessibility for certain things that you and I enjoy that are free or well, free, you know, quote unquote, or that. That we have access to, you know, for, for advancement, whether it's finance, whether it's uh, techno technology, communications, et cetera, et cetera, education, you name it, it's accessibility in general. And I started reading that article and, you know, how certain companies or institutions punish um, poor people because basically because they can. You know, one of them was the credit, um, third of the phone card industry, which we were pretty familiar with being. You know, in Italy, and then here we used them. You know, to, you know, to try to you know stay connected with our relatives, and it was absurd. But once you started digging down, like, oh my gosh, you know how much people, like poor people, depend on them. Well, I, I wouldn't say poor people without, you know, accessibility to a phone or Skype back then. I'm talking about this is in you know, early 2010s, and you say, well, you and I use Skype, and I don't have to pay for that anymore, but. Most of you know most of the population don't have access to the internet, or don't have a credit card. They they don't have that luxury, so they go and buy these cards, and without you know without giving you getting into a lot of details, those phone cards you were basically getting sixty cents on a dollar. That you imagine just going to Starbucks and paying full price for your cup or your venti cup and only getting sixty percent of that product at best. So that was one of the first shocking revelations. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we, and, and we had the technology back then to solve it. And my co-founders like, well, we could either turn a blind eye and continue being comfortable, or we can get uncomfortable and try to solve this. And that's just one of the problems. So uh, with inaccessibility, uh, that digital transformation that left a lot of people behind, and it's still, you know, keep leaving people behind. So that was, you know, that was in essence kind of like why we started it more than how. The how was just like, well, like I said, 
let's do it. Uh, I mean, are, are, are we willing to do this, take on a risk, um, and you know, you know, see what happens? So I was like, well, yeah, and yeah. then then that's that's how it starts. You know, it's it's interesting you mentioned accessibility because. I think that's one piece that a lot of individuals in a lot of different settings um, fail to see and visualize. Uh, you mentioned, you know, having the fortunate, uh, uh, fortunate being raised, you know, in a household that had food, that had access to Internet. You know, uh, I'm, I'm yeah. currently, you know, in the healthcare world in particular, you know, some of these individuals are that are in rural communities are very far away from access from you know, the healthcare they need, but more importantly from the medications, cause there's limited yeah. pharmacies out there. And so I'm sure people at home are thinking, Hey, Mark Cuban, right. cost plus or, or Amazon, they don't have internet. Right. So what do you do when right. you don't have these, these limitations, right? There's limitations that um, you have, whether, whether they're from financial limitations or just geographic limitations, right? Some people live in rural communities that just don't have broadband internet yet, you know? Right. Now, what, or, or what, like you said, you know, like payments, you know, you, you, you can, have, oh, we have Amazon or Mark Cuban and yep. yeah, but you need a credit card. A lot of these people are unbanked or underbanked, so they don't have access to these financial services. So right from the get go, that service won't work. Yep. So what are some things that you guys are currently doing to kind of help address the issue? Well, number one, like, again, first of all, we, you know, in, in our design process and our practice, that's the first thing that we try to do. You, we take that consumer, a human-centric approach uh, into first understanding what the real problem is. You know, how these people, because again, the first mistake also that we've made is like, like oh, we have a solution. The one that we think you, you're going to need. And that's classic. And like, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to create an app. We're going to do blah, blah, blah. Boom. And then nobody uses it. And you're like, oh, crap. Like, wh what's happening? Like, why don't people like what people use? It's like, well, because, you know, you, you're not addressing the real need and you're not meeting the customers where they need to be. You're, you're one of, you you want to pull them and that's not the way it works. Yeah. So number one is like really digging down, understanding. And here are the things where I, I, I can say privilege is literally like taking a blindfold, Gabe. I mean, and that's when you realize, oh, my gosh, we're very fortunate to live the way you you do and you know I, I keep expressing that to my children it's like i don't want to sound like you know my parents or their parents <laughs> like but you are I mean, you gotta acknowledge you know you may not have what you see in your social media as you're not flying private but that's nonsense compared to you know what, what a lot of people the, the, the people struggles if you have a roof and a meal a warm meal uh, at least three you know two or three times a day i mean you're golden you are extremely privileged. Everything else is just a luxury. So that and that's what we, um, again, that's what we try to understand, right? living in these people's shoes, because if you don't, then you really don't have an understanding of, of what the problem is and what solution you can actually bring in. Yeah. Um, so going back to your question, like wh what are we addressing that? It's like, how do we, how can we narrow that digital divide? And first we see, you know, what's, how wide it is. It is pretty wide, I can tell you. I got even wider, like I said, during the pandemic, um, because, you know, that makes sense. most of the, it, it made sense. You know, we were to, um, the, our businesses got obliterated during the pandemic because we weren't accessible online. When we all got, you know, sent home, the Latino, black and brown businesses were decimated at a 44% um, rate, which was much higher than any other demographic simply because we were not searchable because mm -hmm. we don't exist in it. You know, our businesses don't have a, a website. They don't have a transaction mechanism to, to pay online. So, well, let's go with the basic. If you don't have a website, you don't exist. So there you go. So those are the things that we're trying to, number one, measure, then address, and then, okay, now how do we bring you uh, back into the digital world? And, you know, from payment platforms to the essentials, we did a, um, a program with the with the state of Oregon, where we were doing the you know, website website packages uh, with social media packages, basic packages for Latino, black and brown uh, business, small businesses. So number one step, bring into the digital arena. Number two, 
teach you how to use those tools. And number three, developing those tools so you can actually receive payments, send payments, and you know keep you uh, benefit you from attracting a, a different kind of consumer and keeping your businesses afloat. Now, you you're kind of starting this business that's really kind of focused on like helping you know, migrant workers or immigrants, right? To kind of help yeah. them kind of get inspired, get access to the things they need. How difficult was it to really start this business? Did you have a lot of support or did you, you know, run into roadblocks yourself? Oh man, no, it's, it's, it's been super difficult um, because, well, first we, you know, we funded it all, you know, we, we, we raised, you know, some angel capital that gave us, you know, plenty of, um, uh, plenty of resources just to get it started to, to make the initial platform. But again, we, we ran into the roadblocks. Okay, we, we make this technology. Now, how do we deploy it? And that takes a little, massive amounts of dollars, which we couldn't raise because number one, you know, we did the whole VC world and people don't understand the problem because again, they don't live it and exactly. they don't think it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, they don't think it, even back then they didn't think it was a market. Um, now, Fast forward, the, the the things were a little bit more, um, uh, what would I say? Up until a couple of months ago, they, they they were a little more favorable, and we were hoping to, or we're still hoping to raise more capital to really make the make it more scalable. But right now, you know, the, the main barrier is that you know, how do we get this to the to to the consumer? How do we make them understand that this is an option that it that it's and, and gain their trust because that's the most difficult part. How how do you do it? How how do you build their trust? So we did it. You know, we were the first company here in um in the region. I would say, you know, actually north of Los Angeles, that created this digital uh, agency model. Because again, we went with the traditional. We got some recommendations here in town and in Seattle. Like, well, we we have a very little small budget, but we have a budget. How do we reach consumers? And what we heard. Um, this has been 2015, 16, it was like, you really don't understand and, you know, you know how to get the market, even in the Latino community. So what we did is essentially, wow, if you don't have the answers, we have to come up with the answers. So we created that, we created our model. So we, we probably have, no, not probably, we have the largest digital presence right now for any Latino media in the Northwest, uh, again, north of, um, even you know the north of San Francisco, you know, with with the well funded um, entities, but we created that organically. We then we paired up with some celebrities, you know, in, in LA, in Mexico, and we started creating this um, agency model where we can actually benefit our clients now, you know, by by handling their social media with analytics, with content creation, moderation, and curation, and then using it also to grow our own channels and, you know, create that, uh, that, that link with the, uh, with the consumer. You know, one of the things you mentioned when you were kind of creating the business is the angel, angel capital or angel investor, yeah. right. And going through that venture yeah. capital route. Tell us about that experience, that the experience that you had as a minority, because, you know, I think venture capitalists, yeah. uh, you tend to see it sway a different way, right? What was your yeah. experience uh, in that world? Well, it was it was actually a lot of luck. It was tremendous because we and 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 that gave us a lot of confidence in the beginning, which was one of also one of the mistakes. <laughs> uh, and I could tell you that this story, like how we started, we still had our jobs. My co-founder and I, we sat down with one of his friends that said, "Hey, my friend has a digital media company here in town, well known in Portland, has money, and he he may help us and and, and create ideas." So again, this was just an idea. We didn't have a name. We didn't well, forget about pitch text. It was just let's sit down for lunch. We have an idea. There's a problem. We sit down with this guy that I've never met. Uh, his name is Joaquin Lippincott. Shout out to Joaquin. And we're saying he's a tremendous dude. Um, we're sitting at lunch again. I've never met this guy, so we're just talking to him like, "Hey, we have this idea." I met him, blah blah blah. And over lunch, it's like, "All right, let's do it." And both my co-founders like, "Well, let's do what?" It's like we're, I mean, we weren't pitching. You know, it's like we're just asking questions. You know, you obviously started your company out of nothing. Like you grew it. Um, represent. You know, you have big clients like ABC and CBS, the Oscars. You know, kind of stuff like that. And also, he's throwing us the first in-kind checks. Like, let's do it. Let's 
we'll build the app, we'll do the, uh, you know, all the, uh, we'll come up with a name. It was, again, we had no, we have nothing. So we have a brand. So like, all right. So he threw in the first check in kind. So basically just pulling his team, which was a lot of money and a lot of work just to come up with the first iteration of the pro the program, a product, uh, our first ver version of a, a mobile app, um, just to get it to a point where we can actually pitch to investors. So we got them to like, oh my gosh. So of course we started, we, you know, went full time and said, oh, this is easy. And then we had a friend, I, I had a friend still also on our board that I was talking to him, you know, we, we're friends and, you know, we just thought, hey, this is what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And three days later, he's throwing us a, a big check, uh, well, big for for an angel. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this is, this is going to be easy. <laughs> so we got the money just to get started, but just, again, just to get, a, 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 I mean, we're, we're not even touching that money. I'm just going to, right. to, to build. And all of a sudden, crickets, man. There was nothing. So we were, you know, I was, and I was on the the rounds of uh, here in Portland, and uh, you know, going to all the pitch competitions, you know, doing the the right things, and just here, no, no, uh, and and you know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't put all the blame on the on the VCs. It was like, also, we I don't think we had the storytelling really tied to what or, or you know the 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 market address so we, there were a lot of holes because I, i've seen their pitches uh i'll go back and revisit them i'm like yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't put a time in this thing <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't invest it in myself either <laughs> yeah 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 but you know what so here's uh, you just mentioned that 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 after a while i was so frustrated I'm like oh my gosh it's like you know crickets and and nothing and I call Joaquin, you know, the, which is a, is a good mentor. I say, like, hey, man, I got, I got to talk to you, man. I, I, I'm hitting this roadblock. I feel frustrated. What's going on, man? It's like, and I want to say, like, how do we convince you? Or how do we, you know, what was it? What, what am I not doing right that I convinced you? Say, like, and he gave me the best line, honestly, to just like, you know what? I did? And I was like, I, obviously, we didn't have a deck. Right? I was like, I invested in you. I was like, I didn't know you. I mean, you just, you guys came in with lunch. I, I know you're co-founder and all that, but, you know, you, you, you're you genuine, you're honest. And, and I just, you know, he told me, I bought stock on you. So that's what you need to be doing. It's like, oh my God. And that just lifted me up, went out there. We raised a little bit more capital so we could get it, you know, get the first product or first iteration, send it to market, validate. And then, you know, we started growing organically, but it wasn't to the pace where we needed to, to scale because it's a it's a business that for us is it's you know the margins are super razor thin it's a it's a it's a volume um it's a volume business so we need to raise a lot of money to obviously get into a lot of hands and uh, at some, at that point we couldn't so we made some partnerships with you know people in the entertainment world and that's what gave you know that's what gave us enough momentum to at least get it get it moving but yeah, yeah no you're right i mean lo lots of barriers yeah, yeah. Now, is this your first business? Uh, real business, yes. Now, yeah, what yeah. would you say has been kind of difficult going through this this process of raising money, getting the app out, and then actually helping out the community? Uh, what has the most difficult has been? Oh my gosh, I want to say that what the most is like everything is like just because they're you know it's just like a roller coaster. There's yeah. days that are like. Man, it's just kind of calm, which has been lately, and and now you're a little suspicious. But then th there's <laughs> days that it's, it just feels that everything just goes sour. You know, uh, we had problems with security in our platform. We already got hit with cyber crime in the past. Not now. We're, we're, we're come on, knock on wood. Was it's been two years, but we, uh, yeah, th it just not getting in, not getting enough capital just to get it. You know, to to a sizable, when well, we knew we had a good product, but again, you know, in hindsight, all those things are prepared us for um, to 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 make a bet not not only a better product, a better uh, a better pitch, and you know what we really want to do, who we want to serve. Because I want to say, um, if we were raised a lot of capital back then, I think we would have gotten burned really bad with cybercrime. And I think in hindsight, you know, not not raising that capital, it probably saved us. Uh, or I, I don't think we, we we would have withstand what, uh, I mean, the storm that that, that it came in twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen. 
Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned your product. Can you kind of uh, give the listeners at home a little idea of like, one, who is the typical client, you know, for your, and then what kind of products would they expect to receive? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what we created is, is this pay, payment platform and we started aggregating service. Like I said, the first product was an international long distance because we, what we wanted to do is get rid of that dirty industry. So right, like, well, right. you have a card that you scratch, you use one time and that's it. They're not normal. It's about terrible for the environment because those cars are not recyclable. Mm. They have a ginormous footprint. And they're terrible for the consumer. So like, well, we can use voice over IP, essentially the same service, but you don't need the physical attributes. So done. Well, we started with one product, one service. Then we said, well, what else can we do? And we started aggregating international payments for long distance uh, and for or also recharging your prepaid phones, which most of the immigrant community still uses. Yep. So we started with a Mexican carrier, then a U.S. carrier, and it just started, you know, going like that. And... To date, we have about 450 products, services in about 50 countries. Wow. So it started with one product. Yeah. So we char- we recharge AT&T in the U.S., T-Mobile, uh, TrackPhone, pretty much all the MVNOs or the pre- on the prepaid side, Me- from Mexico down to the Patagonia, uh, and a couple of countries in, in the Middle East, Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. So we're starting to expand the footprint. And what it does, essentially, this platform, we enable this platform with other partners like, you know, banking, finance, where they can actually plug in into our, you know, our, our platform and offer these products to the consumer so they can actually, ha- you know, make all their transactions at once. Because here's the thing, again, going back to the product design, what we realized you know, a couple of years ago, you know, banks and a, 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 a bank, mostly banking and financial institutions want to go for the Latino market. And, you know, they do the typical, they put a, a poster with a Latino guy and in, in, in Espanol to check it out. And then they lament themselves like, well, people are not flocking to us. It's like, well, why don't they trust us? Like, well, let me tell you, it's not only, yes, it's a matter of trust number two, number one, but more importantly is you're, you're not, fulf- you know, you're not fulfilling any need. And they're like, yeah. uh, why is that? It's like, we're banking. It's like, well, they don't need you. They don't need a bank. Do you know where the the, the, the financial center of the, the Latino immigrant community is? Like, they were like, no, it's the bodega. That's where they go for making their West, their, 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 their envios de dinero, like money remittance, yeah. their payments to the cell phone, their, their bill payment. A lot of them, they go and cash their checks, the ones that still get paid by check. Yep. So, in essence, those bodegas are the financial centers. And then they also, they buy their their stuff and it's like a social center. Like, now, do you fulfill that? that? No. If you don't, why would they need a bank account? And they're like, well, with the bank account, they can do this. And they're not, well, but they already do it. They, they have their way of doing it. You're not going to convince them to do away with that, to do this. Uh, and then what? How do I maneuver? You know, why do yeah. I need a plastic thing? So you, you're not really showing a benefit. Now, in our platforms, like what we we do is enable them to, to serve as a virtual bodega. Now you can do all those transactions virtually. So now you actually have a value proposition for that client and say, look, you don't need to go to the bodega on Friday and be in the line, especially well, with COVID and touching yep. things. Yeah. And you, you can do it 24-7 through our app through you know or, or web service blah 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 so you, now you're enabling the consumer to actually save time and money but now you have a value added that's a that's a great great point you know two things that you've kind of mentioned throughout this this entire segment is one understanding the realization that hey these i have to go to the consumer and get inside the actual you know the market and understand what the consumer needs are yeah. and not assume my own needs are the same as the consumer Right. That, that's that's a big, big piece um, that you seem to have uh, highlighted. How did how did that kind of, you know, what was the aha moment for you that made this kind of easy for you? Right. So we talked about what was hard. So what what has been easy? Kind of what was that aha moment saying, like, this is the thing that's missing? Well, did you have that moment or do you remember that moment? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, working for my previous employer. I was in somewhere in. Uh, outside of uh, San Francisco, like rural areas, we were visiting clients, um, uh, and we. I, it, it was one of probably one of my first times going into a bodega. Honestly, uh, again, we were 
outside of uh, Palo Alto, like half an hour east. And and when this we're in this bodega, it's in a rural community. And there's nothing around it. So we go in there. We're talking to the to the owner and just trying to understand. You know, we, we you know we were building this automated kiosk machines where you can actually do a lot of payment processing, or like an ATM reverse gotcha. ATM. Yep. And the owner of the guy, like, no, I, I don't really need it. And and all I was doing just observing, like first of all that, and it was on a Friday. We were there for about an hour, and within that hour, we went from being super um, quiet to extremely busy in the afternoon, late afternoon. And I was like, oh, my God, like, what's going on? So, you know, instead I started talking to a bunch of the people online and realizations are like, holy crap, like, this is something that we could solve. Number one, we're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, everybody had to drive to here. And I started to talking to the people like, oh, yeah, we're working on the fields. We're working on the field and I'm doing transaction not only for me, but for other compadres. Oh, wow. Like because not everybody has a car, yeah. and you, yeah. you can get there. There's no public transportation to get you to that little bodega sitting in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Talk about accessibility again. So here we come. He comes, uh, you know, a person with all the money to make the transaction and his little list to make transactions for ten other people, and the guy behind him is doing exactly the same. And behind, so all of a sudden you have a long line, and these people are going to be there for an hour or so, and it's hot. It was hot. It's sweltering. The, the, I mean, it's not. It's very uninviting. But you know what? It's Friday. It's payday. You know, and they will go collect their check, cash it out. So the store makes a cut of that. You know, yeah. check cashing. Now the store is also making money on every single transaction. And my head is like, huh? You know, what's the? You know, look at all the friction and and that. Time, you know, the, the 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 value chain. You have to come from a field getting a ride from someone you you have transactions from x amount of people that are trusting you you know with their money and and you're here for over an hour in the heat and and then you're getting host because every transaction cashing your check sending money back home through you know the remittance money paying your phone bill paying your this every transaction you're like here's a dollar here's two dollars yep. you're getting host and again it went back to my to my the article, like how, why being poor is expensive. Yeah. yeah. And, like, <clears throat> and, and again, you know, it was just the accessibility. Like I can do everything that they, that they, they're doing here, yeah. right here Yep. on my phone. Yep. So why do they need to, why do they, why are they here? Why, I'm sorry. Why can't we just reduce or eliminate that friction and bring them the service to them? You that, know that was the moment. And that's, that's a great point too, that entrepreneurs should take a hold of because what you realize at that moment was it wasn't the bodega owner that was your target audience. It was the right. bodega's owner's customer. And so I've, asking yep. the bodega you know, owner, their insight, certainly that product, in fact, did not provide them any benefits. In fact, it nope. was probably a competitive service, right? Exactly right. So, and yep. so that's, that's one thing I think entrepreneurs should take away from this segment is like, understanding who one you really really truly un have to understand who your customer is who is yeah. your target audience right you can't you can't just shotgun it and visit every hole and see which one makes the biggest impact that's going to take too long right so yeah. one identify who that is and then really truly get in there get get your hands dirty uh get in the community understand their needs and then once you understand their needs and i talk about this in healthcare all the time once you understand their needs you can target their needs it's going to help your bottom line absolutely yeah and, and again it's part of the you know customer journey mapping that out you know who you're by like you say who your audience yep. is who the customer is you know make that profile but that entire journey. And that's when we saw like, oh my gosh, like we could eliminate that journey into um, compact it into a phone. Now that also poses problems, limitations, and those are the ones that you need to iron out. But at least you can realize there, like, yeah, like you said, the the store owner is not my customer. He's yep. I, I, I'm being his I'm actually will be his competition yep. because I will be eliminating all those hidden fees, which which are not hidden, they're like front fees. So for the consumer, make it more democratic, like give it access access to everyone to the same service 24 seven and for free. Yep. Yep. It's very true. You know, it's, it's yeah. very, very true. Now, 
you know, you, you, we've mentioned who your target audience is, right? How do you market to them? Like, how do, how do you brand since, you know, some of these individuals mm-hmm. don't have access to internet, right? We, we talked about some of the limitations. How do you brand to them? Well, we, we, we did, you know, a bunch of them through um, digital. And that's one of the also misconceptions that we Latinos are the number one consumers of digital media in the nation by far in, in all demographics. So once we start looking at, at, at those numbers, also smartphone penetration, we were number one. Um, and I guess it's it's like a status symbol that you come as an immigrant, you have to have your troca and your your smartphone. You know, <laughs> that's one of the things, man. Yeah, I, I mean, don't ask me why, but they, <laughs> we got to have them. So once we started looking at that, I'm like, oh, wow, we can actually reach them. Again, we were the first one that just focused entirely on digital. And I said, you know, again, we did our first launch and we measure every single channel. I mean, we're data-driven people. So yeah. we did TV, radio, print that we did every channel and we build the technology to be able to measure them and i'm talking about this is seven years ago uh we're really pioneers in working just entirely and once we saw the metrics like huh i mean it was no brainers like look you know tv our customer acquisition cost is boom in the roof uh, all through the roof and digital is right here digital it was so that's when we started focusing again really looking where the you know, where the market was moving uh, and trying to attract influencers, you know, we work and we still work with some of the, some some big, pretty big names, and um, and some two of them are partners of ours. I mean, they invested, you know, sweat equity into the company. We gave them a little portion in in exchange for for exposure. And once we saw that, I was like, oh, okay, so th- this is really the way to to do it. And then we start, like I said, also building our digital and like understanding how that works, why why it works, and how could how could we make it better. You know, for the consumer, but also for the influencer as well. Nice. You know, this this entire time we've been kind of talking about, you know, Clica Digital. We've been talking yeah. about you as an entrepreneur, but you're more than that. You also are involved with nonprofits. Talk a little bit about your involvement in the nonprofit world and why it's so important to you. Uh, well, number one, it's just, again, although the, the problem of accessibility, I really involve myself in, in, in that uh, in the aspect of justice, you know, di- digital justice, I'm, um, I'm on the board of Suma, uh, which is just a, a digital platform that's doing that, you know, keeping, you know, bringing people on board online, but also keeping them private and secure. So they're, they're building a bridge in between companies like, you know, mobility, utilities, and the consumer and being that gatekeeper for that information, you know, mostly for vulnerable communities, they call. Um, also, I'm a part of the board of Legacy Healthcare. I mean that's that's more on the health side, yeah. but and it, and it's part again. You know, after the um, after the pandemic is how do we reach the consumers of color? How do we talk to them? You know, how, and and it goes boils down to understand them, what they need, how they consume healthcare, and why do they act the way they they do. So for a large organization, it's uh, it's it's been pretty um to me it's it's been one, it's been very educational understanding how that works, and where they want to be. Um, and then, you know, you know, the, the ones that you, that you and I have been involved with, the Startup Weekend, Pitch Latino, which is, you know, part aspirational, inspirational, and show, you know, and give, you know, providing a platform for young Latino entrepreneurs to be able to get out of the shell, try it, and really try to launch their products and, you know, convert from idea into product or service. So it's 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 a combination of that that inspiration, but also enabling them with everything that they they would require with obviously within the within the means that we can that we can gather, just so so, so they don't go through the same uh, pains that you and I went through. Yep, and that's that's pretty much exactly the concept of this podcast, right? Try to provide some guidance uh, through conversation. To really provide, you know, give the entrepreneur some type of um, vision of like what what it takes to be successful, uh, knowing that there are some pitfalls uh, out there. And so the goal really is to we hope I'm hoping really the audience is getting a good good education from this from hearing these stories and understanding, you know, success uh, doesn't happen overnight. One things things can happen in a day, right? We live in a day, yeah. we're born in a day, we die in a day, and we fall in love in a day. And there's all these things we can do in one day, but success isn't really necessarily one of those things that can happen in a day. Even a lottery ticket oh, no. only, right? You, you, 
the Powerball showed yep. us you're going to have to wait 24 hours before those numbers are yeah. revealed anyway. So, so there's a lot of things. Now, what, Edgar, what advice would you give an entrepreneur? I would say, you know, the things that I've, I've learned is like if, if you want to just try it and fail, uh, learn and redo. I mean, just, just don't give up. Don't take failure as a, a as a testament of who you are. It, it's more like a learning. It's just it's a great learning opportunity, a great master's degree in how not to do something. Um, but yet, yeah, it, it, it just don't be afraid. Just don't be afraid to just go ahead and do it in, in the, what we say in Latino, say, el que dirán, what are they going to say about me, you know, for you know, doing this or for not doing that, like just just do it and 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 see what comes out of it. Obviously, you know, one thing that I do advise is just like just don't launch yourself into the river without looking at right. Is it deep or not? Due diligence. You gotta do the work. You, you don't expect to say, "Oh, my idea is great. I'm gonna do this and it's just gonna succeed." That it, again it doesn't happen like that. You you gotta be meticulous. You gotta be inquisitive, and you gotta work hard. Great, great advice. Yeah. Great advice. Now, for the listeners at home that are interested in connecting with you, maybe they're interested in being a client or just learning more about you, how can they find you? Do you have websites, social media? Where are you yeah. at on the yeah, intro yeah. They, web? They can find me. Yeah, they can find me at clickadigital.com or on LinkedIn. I and mean, if you just Google my name, Edgar Navas Portland, and I think it's LinkedIn.com. I was one of the early adopters of Edgar, uh, LinkedIn.com slash Edgar Navas. Uh, that would be me on top without the beard. So, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, without the beard, he's gonna look a little, that was little pre, younger. <laughs> pre, pre, pre pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People ask me, Oh, that was that 10 years ago? And I'm like, No, that was like two years ago. That's what I look without, <laughs> without the rat in my face. Yeah, man, the pandemic has changed a lot. We have all aged a couple of years. I'm telling oh, you, oh my gosh, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> Edgar, thank you so much for coming on the show. For those listening, you can follow me at the Shades of E on all of the social sites, including TikTok. I am on there. Please uh, subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. You can also buy some swag on theshadesofe.com. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.